when it comes to trauma, anxiety, and PTSD, and the treatment of trauma, anxiety, and PTSD, it's not just the state that you are in or that you go into, it's how you got there and whether or not you had anything to do with it. And this brings us right back to those top-down mechanisms and the narrative around what we are experiencing internally. So let's zoom out and I'll explain how this works and what to do about it. We have this brain structure called the insula. We talked about the insula a few minutes ago. The insula is calibrating how we feel internally versus what's going on externally. It's involved in setting whether or not what we are feeling is appropriate given what's happening. We have a system that can generate threat responses. And in the case of trauma, PTSD, and extreme stress, chronic stress, that system gets ramped up so that it takes very little, maybe even just a memory or maybe even a, uh, an association that we're not even aware of, you know, a location triggers something, we're not even aware of it, and we start experiencing that symptomology. How do we recalibrate the system? Well, most of the approaches that are out there involving drug treatments, typical drug treatments would involve suppressing the level of internal arousal, just trying to bring that down. Now, some of those drug treatments work, but oftentimes they don't. And if you think about it, it's probably not surprising that they don't because by taking a drug that just lowers your anxiety overall, you're creating a different sort of miscalibration of the system. So what we've been doing in human subjects is having them do either breathing protocols that calm them, and I'll explain what that is in a moment, or doing breathing protocols that increase their level of autonomic arousal and seeing how that impacts their response to stress overall, not just during that particular breathing protocol. So the calming protocol that, that we use involves these uh, physiological size. I've talked about these um, previously on the podcast and elsewhere, but if um, you just need a reminder, if you haven't heard about it, there's a pattern of breathing that we all do in sleep when our carbon dioxide levels in our bloodstream get too high. And we do this when we get claustrophobic meaning we do it reflexively. And that's a double inhale through the nose followed by a long exhale. So it's, and yes, the inhales should be through the nose and yes, the exhales should be done through the mouth, ideally. So it's a big filling of the lungs through two breaths back to back in inhales. Even if you can only sneak in a little air on that second one, no talking to, if you're gonna do it right. And then a long exhale, which allows you to offload a lot of carbon dioxide in the exhale. And we have people doing that in real time, anytime they experience stress, but the particular breathing protocol that we've been giving human subjects is for them to do the, the repeated, what we call cyclic sighing. So double inhale, exhale, double inhale, exhale, double inhale, exhale, repeatedly for five minutes, which is actually a pretty long time to repeat that, but you can do it pretty slowly. And people report and the data point to the fact that it's very calming. People feel more relaxed afterwards and that relaxation wicks out into other um, aspects of their life. Now, we did not look at stress and trauma in that condition. We also have another condition where people do what's called cyclic hyperventilation, which is very different and creates a very different internal state and is somewhat stressful. It's five minutes a day of stress, much like the study that I just, just described. And it involves basically doing this, uh, what I'll do in a moment, uh, for five minutes, which is hyperventilating, which is... <sighs> but not continuously for the five minutes because uh, many people would pass out or feel extremely uncomfortable. It involves inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, very deep, inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. And then every 25 or 30 breaths or so doing a full exhale and holding one's breath, lungs empty for about 25, maybe 30, maybe even 60 seconds, and then continuing until five minutes is up. Subjects report and our data indicate that people feel a heightened level of autonomic arousal. In fact, I can feel it right now, even from that very brief uh, cyclic hyperventilation bout I just did, you feel a heating up, you feel a, um, uh, some people will perspire, some people get wide-eyed, some people feel agitated, that's adrenaline being released into your system. Now, I'm not suggesting everyone run out and do this. And if you have a predisposition to panic attack or anxiety attacks, please don't do this because it is very stimulating and can trigger those sorts of attacks. But this five minute a day protocol of cyclic hyperventilation does lead to big increases in autonomic arousal. So it, it's, it's stressful in air quotes, but to bring us back to the uh, my colleague, David Spiegel's um, quote, it really was him that said it, not me. It's not just about the state that you're in. It's about the state that you're in plus 
how you got there and whether or not you directed entry into that state. And that point of that one directs their own entry into a state deliberately is really key. And I think has an important implications for whether or not there's stress relief and fear relief and trauma relief from bringing oneself into a state of increased autonomic arousal. Why? Because of the way that that fear and trauma circuitry is organized. If you recall, it's got these components of how external events can trigger an internal stress response and fear response and trauma response, but there's that top-down prefrontal component that can inhibit certain components aspects of that fear and threat circuitry. Now, earlier we were talking about that prefrontal circuit being engaged through narrative, through self-directed deliberate narrative. It's the person deliberately retelling the story. Here we're talking about a deliberate reactivation of the sensations in the body. So where I think this is all going, meaning where my laboratory and the Spiegel laboratory and other laboratories out there are taking this is you can imagine a very brief five minutes a day, two weeks was the time that they did this for five minutes a day for two weeks intervention in which people with the support of a clinician, we would hope would deliberately induce a physiological state that's very stressful, right? Not shying away from the stress response, but increasing their own stress response deliberately and maybe in conjunction with recounting the traumatic or fearful circumstance. This is far and away different than the kind of state of mind and body that would come about in a ketamine assisted trauma induced psychotherapy session or a MDMA assisted trauma psychotherapy session or in a narr purely narrative based psychotherapy session aimed at alleviating fear or trauma. The reason I like these sorts of interventions is that A, they are very low cost or even zero cost, right? One could, you could imagine um, doing this while journaling or uh, while recounting a particular experience. Again, they're very compact. Five minutes a day for two weeks is what was done in this particular mouse study. We don't know if that translates directly to the human study or not. What was interesting is that if they used longer daily bouts of stress, like 15 minutes a day, that actually exacerbated the trauma and exacerbated the fear. So one has to be very careful. Stress and deliberate entry into stress and self-stressing are very potent tools. They're very sharp blades that it does appear or it's likely can help alleviate trauma and fear. But how long to do this, exactly what the protocol should be is still something that needs to be cultivated. I know there are gonna be people out there that nonetheless are going to want to experiment with some of this. I will say that I do not think it matters how one gets into that stressed state, provided it is self-directed and that therefore could be cold shower. It could be ice bath. It could be uh, anything that induces an acute, meaning a sudden onset um, of adrenaline and is self-directed. That's really the key feature here. So I'm very excited about these data, both the five minute intervention data from the animal study, the work that's ongoing in my laboratory and Dr. Spiegel's laboratory, and the work that's being done on the insula, because I think what we're starting to see now is a picture of fear and trauma and PTSD that has this sensory component, what's happening in the world around us, this internal and interoceptive component, you know, how appropriate are the signals that are occurring in my body? I mean, let's face it, if you almost get hit by a car and your heart rate is, you know, 140 beats per second, and that lasts for a little while and you're kind of stressed out and you don't get the best night's sleep, that's pretty normal. That means you have a healthy fear system. If that persists and you're dealing with a lot of issues a week later, six weeks later, two years later, then it's moved into the realm of trauma and PTSD. So, we need to always be taking into account the different components of the circuitry. I do think that deliberate self-directed entry into these short bouts of stress is a very promising approach. And it's one that if people are going to experiment, I just again wanna caution people with anxiety or panic disorders, be very cautious, probably don't do it. Ideally, you would do this in conjunction with support from a clinician. But I'm also aware that there are a lot of people out there that are dealing with trauma and dealing with post-traumatic stress of various kinds and that they're desperate for uh, various self-directed intervention approaches.